Hi, I'm Out of Darts. Today you'll notice you are looking at my hands and not at my face. Today I'm finally going to share the uh, full ultimate mod guide for my rival Hurricane. Uh, I've shot this in super clean 1080p from a 4K camera and hopefully the extra detail makes the guide a little better. Uh, I will also be able to send a link to a direct high def download uh, full quality file to anybody that's purchased my kit. And uh, that way with QuickTime it's a little easier to pause and rewind than YouTube is. Before we start, I want to make sure that it's clear that this is what I would call like a, a level 4 out of 5 mod. You don't need crazy skills, but you will need some time and patience. The only difficulty level above this is to either add programming or starting to cut and integrate multiple blasters, or perhaps building something from scratch. This is the version of the Hurricane that's my favorite. It's sleek and it's very low profile while still having a 90 ball capacity. I have followed so many tutorials online for Nerf where I really couldn't see what was actually happening either due to poor focus or lousy lighting or just plain bad video quality. I won't mention specifics but there were a couple videos where I literally couldn't figure out the wiring based on the video which means to me the video wasn't as successful as it could have been. Please let me know after the video what you think of this and if you want to see more of this in the future. Let's get down to it. This guide is to use with my 3D printed parts that I sell in my Etsy shop, but obviously all the techniques and how you do the wiring really apply to the PVC version as well. It's a ton of work to get the PVC pipes to fit and it's a lot heavier as well as bulkier, which is why I've taken the uh, 3D printed part approach. We're gonna cover every step of the process from, from the teardown to the optional full auto mod, a full rewire to the, the cutout to fit the blower and the construction of the kit. Let's talk about what you're going to need to complete this mod. First, you're obviously going to need a rival blaster along with a 3D parts kit or PVC if you're going to go that direction. These are all custom fit. They glue together and interlock with the Zeus. The back uh, magwell fits on the back of the blaster, has little indents just like the stock magwell. And again, it holds 90 balls. The back fe features a flip top lid, which is held in with neodymium magnets. That way it'll stay put when you're playing and running around. The final assembly looks a little bit like this. This is currently the orange color, but I also sell black. I think the orange, while not exactly the Nerf orange as you can see here, is just really cool because it's almost iridescent and neon-like and uh, just kind of flashy. And a big part of this mod is like, I love it when I'm running around the field and people see me coming with it because it's really obvious. So I'm not trying to hide the, uh, the uh, effect of the mod. Along with the blaster and parts kit, you're also going to need polycarbonate tubing, a DC voltage boost circuit, a micro switch, a squirrel cage blower. This one's from sparkfun.com and it's the best I've found for power and price point. They're only five bucks plus shipping. You'll also need XT60 connectors or another way to connect your battery unless you want to hardwire it permanently. You'll need a 3S LiPo. You're going to need hobby wire. I use 16 gauge because it can handle plenty of current. Super glue. I like the thick stuff. It's a little easier to work with and it seems to harden up nice and fast. Acrylic cement a Dremel or similar rotary tool, hot glue gun, wire cutters, and also helpful is a bandsaw or jigsaw, but you can do this with the Dremel itself. Additionally, you're also going to want a voltmeter, doesn't have to be fancy, some heat shrink tubing, and a few other various tools that you should have lying around if you're already doing Nerf mods. All of the parts are listed below in the description. I'll try to put links up for as much as possible. Additionally, a lot of the un more unique parts do come with my kit that's on my Etsy shop, also listed in the description. All right, part one, disassembly. So here we've got our brand new blaster, which I'm going to uh, open up. So now uh, these pieces here uh, are totally optional and I don't prefer not to use them because they get in the way of the tubes. I also think it's a little sleeker without them. I may make some sort of plate that goes here, but again, that's totally up to you. But for me, I'm gonna to toss that aside, and here we have our blaster. Now, first thing we're gonna to wanna to do, obviously, is, uh, as Drac would say, butterfly the blaster and get all the screws out. It's worth noting that this is a number one Phillips screwdriver, and that is the size you should use. So we can pull this whole guy out. And I like to remove all my screws and put them into a little dish because it's so easy to lose them and it's going to be several hours worth of, of prepping and working before we actually get uh, the screws put back in. So I typically just uh, try to get them all out. Now that we have all of our screws taken out, we can set this top shell aside for a moment. 
and we can set our screws aside and we can set this aside. One other part I forgot to mention is you are obviously going to need a soldering iron of some sort and of course solder. Another note is anytime you are cutting or soldering, please wear safety glasses and uh, make sure you always have them on. I just use these cheap $1 off Amazon and you can buy a dozen for $11. They're also great for Nerf. So part two is cutting, drilling, and demolition. Here we're gonna get rid of all the stock wiring we don't need. So I typically just go in and immediately start cutting out all the parts that I don't know I'm not gonna need. And we are basically gonna remove everything. So you can rip this board out. There is no wiring that's gonna stay in here after we are done with our mod. Um, so I usually just first pull out all the, the wiring. And then you can take, shit, pliers. What happened to my pliers? There they are. Oof, shit. Man, that moves a lot when I bump it. No, these are good. These terminals here. These terminals here can be ripped right out. No need to be gentle. That sounded really violent, but it really is fine. Again, number one Phillips to start pulling pieces out. We are going to take out the existing micro switch and assembly because it's, of course, much too low amperage for our purposes. So this is also garbage. Again, players are usually very helpful. These, this can go, this can go. So the only part from this assembly down here that we are actually going to need are is this little plate, the two screws that go in it, and this one piece. Our spring action will actually come from our micro switch in the end of this. Next you can take the flywheel housing out. In order to lift this flywheel cage out of here, you do need to go to the back side and slide this open. It interlocks in the back there and, and disables you from being able to take it out. So we can take that out and we'll set that aside and we'll start working on that in a minute. This part may come off, no big deal. For my version, we are also going to remove this top plate completely because I have my own custom designed part that has a hole in it to allow the charging to happen through the hole. That way you don't have to remove the battery. And so this just slots in. It's designed very similar to the original piece. So take your flywheel housing and we're gonna flip it upside down and uh, attempt not to lose the screws like I always do. We're gonna pull this, this back plate off and pull the electronics out. Don't need any of this. This is all uh, garbage throw away. Now this mag lock and all of these pieces up here, you do not need. All of this goes away. You can save them in case you ever want to go back, but I personally um, just put them in a little bit and have never touched any of them on the half dozen Zeus's I own. I do, however, put this plate back in place just to compensate for the space there. If you flip the cage back over, we'll now open the front side. And now here's where we need to make the decision whether we're doing full auto or semi. If you're doing semi-automatic, don't even open this part up. Just leave everything as it was and your blaster will work just fine. Um, with semi-auto, you can make the choice to remove the actual pusher, which is this part here, uh, because with the airflow, the pusher isn't entirely needed and that'll give you a lighter trigger pull but a less snappy feel if you remove this. If you don't mind the heavy trigger pull, then I'd say leave, leave this in and don't don't take this part off that I just took off, just leave it alone. Now if you are going to do full auto, what we need to do here is first we need to remove this pusher, which is actually on the other side, so I'm going to... take this half off. And now we have the pusher mechanism which we can actually uh, set aside or discard because unless you're keeping semi-auto. So for full auto, remove this piece. After you've done that, and while we're open in here, we need to look at this side piece. You'll see there's a little bevel that's right here. You want to dremel out this entire piece here. So I'm going to put on safety glasses, as I've mentioned before. 
Now, as you're working on this, it's very important that we get this completely flush because while the fan has a lot of power, it does not have a lot of power after pushing 90 balls through the chamber. So by the time you're done with this, you want this smooth and you want it totally flush with this, with the inside of there. And so you can see here that I've got it nice and flush and it should be very, very clean. Along with that, we're also going to want to take this other side and you'll notice there's a little beveled lip here. This lip will also catch balls and um, is probably the leading cause of restriction that I've seen on people doing my mod without uh, having the guide and whatnot. So this as well, we're going to sand until it's completely flush. And clean off any bad edges. That looks pretty darn good to me though. And so that is ready to be put back together. Next we've got, as you actuate this, you can see there's a stopper for the sem semi-auto. We're gonna need to remove that as well. And uh, that comes out without actually having to remove any screws. You just gently grab this, or not so gently if you don't care about it. And now we have essentially set this up as full auto. So now all that happens when you pull this trigger is that it opens a gate. So there's just a single gate, nice and smooth. It stops the balls when the blower is blowing on them. But when you pull the trigger, you're gonna have full unrestricted at whatever speed your blower is, is going. The great thing about the blower is that it is definitely not as, uh, excessively fast as the spring. So now we're going to reassemble this side. And that's all set as far as the mechanical locks and removing. Um, now what that's done is because we've removed the locks, you'll now be able to shoot at any time. You do want to be careful with this. It does take some training because if you do shoot at any time and you don't have balls in there, what can happen now is you can jam your flywheels. Let's say you're just sitting idle and you pull the trigger. Your flywheels will jam because there'll be no um, power going through them. Next, we're going to do some desoldering and pull off some of the junk we don't want. I've got my solder, soldering iron here, my Hako, which I love. I'm going to have another review of that coming soon. But essentially, we're just going to go, go in here and uh, remove these resistors. You can clip them off or you can desolder them. There are two tabs here that need to be done. It's right here, and right here, right here, and right here. And again, all of that garbage can go away, and now we have nice, clean terminals to solder to later. Now we can put this little piece back on, this cover. And we've got our four screws back in there. So the flywheel cage sits here and we're going to need to route several wires underneath. And I like to personally create good passages for these things to go through. And there's a nice channel here for wires, but it actually ends up dead at the other side. So right here, we're gonna take a, a bit or a drill, whatever you want, and just drill a little hole. And all I've done is punch a hole so we can get straight through. If you don't do this, it's totally fine. You can go underneath here. I just find that it's a real pain getting uh, 16 gauge wire underneath here. Um, we are also going to need to route wires all the way down down here. So we're going to punch a few holes through these as well. These holes just need to be big enough to get uh, 16 gauge wire through. I'm going to put a notch right here. And that'll get us so we have a clean path for our switch, which will be in here. It'll go all the way up through underneath, and the other wire will come back. While we're notching holes, I'm also going to punch two holes in right here and right here. Allows us to much, allows for the wires to pass through much easier. Again, I'm using this little um, Dremel bit, but a drill bit would be fine too. I like to do all of my dremeling when possible at the same time. So the next thing we're actually going to do is to fit the, the switch in. So the placement of, this, of my switch that I like to do with this blaster is the rev, rev trigger goes here and I like to place this right in here. So what we're gonna need to do is dremel all of this flush with this piece right here, that little fin that sticks up. So we're gonna dremel this, this, all of this here to be flush with 
roughly that, and then we're gonna bring that down so everything ends up about the level of this. Then we're gonna put some JB Weld in there, and that'll give us a nice, good place to attach our switch. Now, you can feel free to do your own thing. Uh, place your own micro switch, or even do a different kind if you like. Uh, this is a 10 amp, which is technically a little underrated for this, but I haven't run into any problems with that in dozens of days of play. So as I go along, I just test the micro switch to fit. I want the spring from the micro switch to actually be the retraction spring on the trigger itself. And so you want to give a little positive pressure when you glue, glue this in. You don't want to have, at least I personally like to have a little bit snappier. So here you can see where it's at like a very long pull. But if I push this so it's almost clicking, I get a little tighter snap action on there. So that's a pretty good spot there. I've got that kind of mocked up. Um, and next what we're going to do is fill this area with JB Weld so we've got a nice flat surface that'll be reliable and hold this for uh, a long time without uh, coming loose. So I've actually changed my mind here. A second ago we were using JB Weld and we're actually going to, we're instead going to use this um, other putty which is a little faster setting. Can't wait another six hours or I will not get this tutorial done. Um, so this is another kind that I've used uh, in other, other versions. You can see here I've got it in here and this is great. It's sandable. Um, you essentially just work it with your with your fingers. It's got a core that is a different material than the outside, and when you mix them mix them the two together, they they get solid. One solid color. It'll go light whitish blue. Now we are going to just uh, basically jam this in here to uh, to fill our gaps. So now this should get reasonably hard in about an hour and it, then it should be workable. And so what you're looking for here is that you can take your switch and it should sit nice and level and have plenty of room. And you just wanna make sure that your switch has a clear path all the way through. So if that's looking good, you can either, um, you actually can let this dry with this in place and then glue a little bit more additional around it or you can pull it off. Um, what I prefer to do is pull it off let everything dry and then glue the switch in place with an actual glue. Um, what's great about this little this putty is that it's actually it's sandable, it's um, dremelable, if that's a word. So you actually can you know be pretty sloppy on how you put it in here. As long as it's in, you can go ahead and mess with it later. While I'm waiting that on that epoxy to dry, I'm going to go ahead and dremel out a few other things that we need to take care of. The first is that this garbage all needs to go away. So what I do is I usually cut about right here. You do not have to be super accurate about this. You just want to leave a little bit there so you can uh, have a little cap. And you can, of course, uh, if you like, uh, go ahead and clean this up and uh, sand this down just so when you pull it off, uh, it's not in your way. Next we're going to mock up where we're going to put this uh, switch. What this does is allows you to cut the power to the flywheel so you can use your rev trigger, your rev trigger to uh, power just the feeding system, which is how I feed my blaster without actually making all the noise of revving. That way your opponents can't hear you while you're doing it. So this is just a matter of marking four points on here where we're going to actually cut this in. So now I've got this hole uh, cut large enough so I can just pop the switch in there. And that way we've got on off for that. So I like mine so the on switch is forward when it's on. I just, it's easier to remember. It's, it's one flick with your thumb. It's forward ready to fire. So I think that works really well. Um, now we're gonna take this and we're gonna flip it over. And uh, we're going to just hot glue around this uh, area here. Yet another few days. So essentially, um, just fill in the whole area around it while pushing pressure on the other side. Don't need to go crazy, um, but I find that this is just a nice way to be able to do this. So next we're going to take our fan, which while I love the fan itself, I don't like these nubs that stick out. Um, when this sits in the blaster, these are the top of the blaster, so those actually stick up and out. Now you can choose to leave them as is, or you can take them off. Uh, and I'm personally going to grind them all down. And this bottom one I'm going to grind down because it makes the, it sit a little, sit a little lower in it. So.
For the purposes of this mod and this video, I'm going to stop here. I'm not going to go any further. You could uh, sand this completely flush, and then of course you could prime and paint this if you wanted and actually make a master match your blaster. Um, I am not a master of cosmetics, and therefore I'm just going to get this functional so I can continue with the rest of this mod. So we can set this aside. So we could continue with the wire just like this, but I'm going to recommend that you actually... Um, so what we're going to do here is uh, we are actually going to um, break open this corner of the fan. Um, I do it with the pliers instead of a Dremel because I feel like it's a little easier to do and a little a little safer. And so what, what my ultimate intention here is to replace this wiring with something a little more heavy gauge to match the rest of our system. Um, the blower is a very important part of this uh, blaster because it is our feeding mechanism. So I usually like to just break off a little bit as needed here and that should do it there and then we're going to pull out our soldering iron again and uh, these definitely have some plastic on them so you're going to feel those melt and then you're going to be able to pull off. Um, so orientation we've got for reference on the left as you're facing this way our left lead is our positive our right lead is our negative. We'll come back to this later. I should note that it's not totally required to seat the fan in like this. You could definitely, with your final blaster design, do the opposite and actually have it sticking out of the top. This way you wouldn't have to cut the shell or deal with any of that. You just have to find a way to secure this, which could be even just double stick tape. Uh, personally, I like really like the minimalized look um, because it's a lot sleeker and I can see down the barrel of the gun a lot better. So next we are going to figure out where our fan is going to sit. And I, again, like the minimal look. So essentially this fan is gonna sit here, but it's going to sit inside the actual shell. And so to do this, we're going to have to um, trace and cut holes here uh, to actually uh, allow for that to sit inside. So the size of the hole that we're gonna cut is three and a half inches this direction and an inch and a quarter this way. And the way you're looking at that is you're gonna measure that from the top down here on the back of the blaster. Now you want the fan to sit basically as far back as you can, but still have room for your plug to uh, seat in the back of the blaster. So what I'm looking at is essentially you just find your final placement, which is for us going to be about here. Um, that way I've got my, my plug that can sit in here and this will just kind of go right up against it. So starting from that point, there's essentially this rib right here. Um, this second to last one rib here, we're going to keep that rib and we're going to work on everything forward from there. So our first mark is going to be just right in front of that rib. So that's mark one, and then we're going to mark, uh, cut three and a half inches forward. So here I've got four points measured out where I'm going to cut. <clears throat> Essentially what will eventually happen is we'll sandwich the fan in between the two halves. You will not only have to cut through the top two layers here, but you'll also need to cut down through this bottom rib here a bit to get the fan to fit. It will be fairly, fairly obvious as you cut in and start putting this in. And then on the other side, once we've got this in here, we're going to have to cut a U-shape, a half circle, to match the airflow to allow this in. So I'm going to go ahead and make those cuts and... Now we've got our rough hole cut. Um, obviously we're going to continue cleaning this up and basically we just keep working until we've got this uh, widthwise fitting and um, sandwiched in between the blaster so it can sit like, like such. So now we've got the top hole cut and I like to make sure that as I kind of trim this down and clean this up that it's actually slightly small. That way when you pinch the shell back together with these two screws it will actually make this very secure which holds the rest of the tube in place really well. So what I tend to do is uh, those base measurements I go a little bit under and then sand out. Now I will say that did take me about 30 minutes just to cut that little piece out and I'm not, I haven't even finished cleaning it up. I also haven't cut the obvious hole here. Um, now this hole over here can be any shape you like, but I generally just sort of trace a half circle and cut um, 
similar shape to this. Hello autofocus. I took this to the scroll saw and cut here. Uh, the scroll saw actually didn't, that I had, didn't cut quite as cleanly as I'd liked. And as I was cleaning up, you can probably see here, I actually scarred the surface here. Now, if someone was gonna paint this, that would actually get covered over. Um, and it's probably actually the best cut I've made so far. I'm really not a great cosmetics guy. I come up with fun ideas and whatnot, but I'm just not good and don't have the s small patience, I guess, to do some of these things. So that's probably where I'm gonna leave it at for now. But now as that sits together, So now we can see this is the final placement of how this will sit in the blaster. Um, the 3D part will connect to here and we've got a nice clean profile. And I like this because I think it just looks uh, a lot better and you're making use of some of the space inside. Now there are some other solutions that are out there. Uh, an EDF, an electronic ducted fan with a brushless mower, mo blower would be, blush, brushless motor would be much better and much smaller. But they're also a lot more expensive. The motor's costing 30 plus dollars by themselves, plus needing a controller, uh, electronic speed controller, and an Arduino controller. So that's really a lot of uh, you know, extra cost that I don't think is necessary. So that's why I've stuck with this and the voltage boost for now. Maybe I'll explore that in the future, but um, I found this to work really well. Now it's been long enough, and this is hardened here, and we are ready to actually place our micro switch. Um, so we're going to place this in. You just need these three pieces and a screwdriver. Built this up a little too much, so I'm going to actually have to take a Dremel to this and just um, flatten this out a bit. So now I've found a placement that I'm comfortable with. This feels good. So after I've got that all set up, I'm going to leave it right where it is, and then we're going to grab a little bit of, uh, of this uh, acrylic cement. Now you can use other, other stuff as well, but typically you don't want to use uh, super glue around switches, so this is a better better fit here. So I usually just put a little bit down on the bottom. And so you do want to be careful not to use too much on the bottom here. I usually kind of dab it around, almost let it uh, cure for a second. So it doesn't, you don't want to get anything flowing into your actual micro switch. Now, again, you could use any kind of micro switch you want here. This is just what worked for me. And again, after I actually have glued it, I also like to get back in there and test. And then you also want to make sure that after you've done all this, that this still fits in here, because that's sort of important. You'll see that I've actually gone a little too far on the grinding of this here, and I hit this uh, cap, which this screws into. Really won't make a difference. While we're waiting for that to hold, I, um, I, will, I usually like to build up just a little bit around the corners to make sure that that's not going anywhere as it gets stressed. Always, as you, this is a, a good tip here, as you're waiting for this to dry, always double check that this is still clicking the way you want it because there's nothing worse than like getting a uh, switch in place and then realizing after that it doesn't even do what you need it to do anymore. Now I'm gonna take that out, make sure that's in the right position. If you think it's in danger of moving, you can clamp it down. I don't think it's going anywhere. So now we're gonna start with the wiring. I always like to start with a spool and try to keep as few cuts on the wire as possible. And we're gonna start with positive, which is actually here, sorry. Basic soldering rules apply. Try not to move the joint when you're doing it, otherwise you're gonna get a cold weld. And again, rather than soldering twice onto this point, I'm just going to... Now I will post a wiring diagram of this, uh, though some people think I have an engineering background or something like that, I definitely do not. I uh, wiring diagrams actually make me dizzy, <laughs> uh, mainly because I never learned to look at them, I think, and my brain just doesn't work that way anymore, or ever. So this uh, negative wire is going to go to our toggle control control switch, which is, exists on the other side of the shell right here. So I'm going to just uh, generously cut, just in case, a little bit extra off. And that way we can start backwards now from oval to, over to the control switch. Now. Because of what we did earlier, we already have these um, these wire uh, guides and holes that everything can follow. That way they're all um, good all the way along. And then we need to get this all the way back over to here from the actual toggle switch itself. So we're gonna run this wire through back up to where where we started. And that way everything will remain nice and clean. It'll stay out of the way of the switches. So this negative lead that's going down here will be split up here and it will go to both the uh, DC boost circuit for the blower fan, basically to the blower fan, and it will also go to the toggle switch here. That way when you hit this rev switch, it will turn on just the blower, but only 
the flywheels will only go on if this toggle switch up here is on. And as I classically do, I have noticed that I need to actually get myself one more hole here. Not so much a hole as a channel, but basically this just needs to flow, should flow very smoothly and not um, come above these ribs here because the slide for the trigger does need to still go there. Little kink in it so we can actually run it uh, without too much torque on the wire here. One half of this is going to the battery, and from the battery the other will go to both the blower in the back and the toggle switch in the front to power the motors. This is our one that will be split and will go to both, and this will go to our battery, so I'll leave just enough room to put a connector, well, let's say right in here. Again, we're going to send this line through everything, and um, while this might seem like a little bit of a pain in the butt to to deal with now, it's um, I just find it so much easier to keep to do some of these little holes rather than have um, the uh, parts bounce around or uh, so there we've got our lead coming back out and then that's going to fish through this hole as well. That way when you put the shell together it's really easy to get everything in place. So now that we've got our negative leads going in and out of the rev trigger we can actually fasten down our flywheel cage. So I've got this back in position. want to grab uh, his long last friend here. Get that in place, and we can go ahead and uh, lock it all down. So it's an always a good idea whenever you're doing anything wiring like this to make sure you actually go ahead and test the polarity that you've set up. So I've got red on red, that's positive on positive, and negative or ground on negative. And uh, you don't actually have to put a ball in there because you'll feel the airflow. If you feel airflow out of the front, it means you've got it correct. So for once, I've actually wired something uh, properly. Um, so on the wire that's actually headed back up to the front for the switch, which will go from motor to the toggle switch to our rev switch, we're going to need to split this off into two lines. And the reason for this is that half of that line is going to go continue on for our circuit. And so I'm going to strip away a little bit of wire, like so, and I'm going to cut the end off, and we can thread this guy through. So to make this a little more clear, the clean lead that's not going to be split coming from here, we're going to go ahead and connect this to our uh, XT60 connector for our battery. And I'm going to do that now because uh, black goes to negative, and I'm going to do that now because it just keeps it a little more obvious what um, what's what and what you're looking at. And I do use shrink wrap on each of these connections as well because I think it uh, could save you from a ground short later. So now that we've got uh, our negative connected there, and we can at the end we will shrink wrap that in as well. We know that that goes down to our switch. Switch comes back up to both the blower and to our uh, uh, on-off switch for the motors. So next we'll wire in. So next we will wire. We'll splice in for our cutoff circuit for the flywheels. And I will probably wrap a piece of e tape over this later since I did not remember to add. So now this will go up to our on-off switch up here. So we can cut that just long enough. I like to leave these a little long because then if you ever need to open the shell later, they are still attached to the other side. So we leave them long enough that we've got a little bit of flexibility. There's nothing moving up in here. As long as they don't touch the flywheels, you're uh, pretty safe. Now you're gonna wanna grab your second shell. And so this is where I typically grab a voltage current tester and just make sure that uh, while the switch is on, which is the forward position, that I am going to the two correct ones. There are two pairs here and so here it looks like these first two are correct. If I were to go to these back two, that would be wrong. If I were to go to the front two, those are disconnected. You can have two sets of switches going through, but basically front half, back half, those are your two, which is pretty obvious, but it's good to test before soldering. So we're gonna solder these on just like this.
I ne neglected to say that we can now uh, plug this guy back up over here too and actually put our our uh, rev trigger back in. So we're going to do that really quick while we're at it because we do want to close close up this end of the blaster. You do want to test this and make sure that you're not you haven't over tightened or anything like that and that this still is hitting your uh, mi micro switch. And here you can hear clicking. That's great. So we're all set there. So we also want to run this red wire back through. This can go on the other side if it's more convenient. I sometimes find just having extra holes was simpler. And we'll cut these off at the same length because they're both going to connect to our voltage boost circuit and allow us to power our fan at the end. This is our voltage boost circuit. It's very clearly labeled. It has an inside negative and positive, outside negative and po positive. Do not, do not, do not do this backwards or you will see gray smoke and it will be fried. Um, so these are made by Drock. You can buy them on Amazon. They're about eight bucks a piece, $7. It, it really varies depending on the price. So um, obviously we're going to take the uh, in voltage because we are going to the fan and we're gonna wire these two in now. You will find that 16 gauge wiring is too big to go through these terminal holes. And uh, that's simply because this is way heavier wiring than you need for the fan purposes. But I still like to rewire everything uh, just in case. And obviously for the blower, uh, it's less important than it is for the actual uh, motors. Okay, so now I'm going to wire in the uh, incoming voltage, positive and negative for the voltage booster. And then we wire the outgoing positive and negative, continuing on to our blower. Again, these connections with the 16 gauge wiring will have uh, a loss of current, but the fan only pulls uh, under two amps total. At, so we've got plenty of, um, we don't need 16 gauge wiring for that. From there, we'll cut these long enough so we've got uh, room to put them onto our fan itself, which will sit up, up here in the middle. Leave a little extra in case you have to negotiate around a little bit. Now we've got one last wire to run um, back to our battery, and that's our positive lead. So our positive lead will go here. So we need to um, wire this from our XT60 connector, or whatever connector you're doing, or your battery source, all the way back to uh, tie into this same line. Now essentially it doesn't matter where you tie in, but I just find it easiest to tie in on the same, same spot there. So now that we've got that there, we've got one final connection to make, and that's to our XT60. Heat shrink the last connection here for the, the positive uh, battery terminal. So I think in this pack, in this one, I'm going to go with what I've been doing more often, and that's putting a smaller pack in there. I find that this 1300 pack actually lasts uh, an entire day, so I haven't had a problem you know, needing to deal with it more than that. Um, and the current that it can output is just as high as the other one. So really it's just a matter of kind of figuring out where stuff's gonna fit. I probably could have done a little bit better job here actually making sure there was enough room, but um, it will definitely fit. It's just gonna be a little bit tight. Um, but uh, it wouldn't hurt to, to leave yourself more room. Now as far as actually charging, you have a couple different options. Um, you can buy my flat top plate, which will go in here and have a hole for this to stick out of. And that way, you can also just sneak it all the way back here to behind, right in front of the fan, and uh, kind of have it coming out of there. And that way, you can just tap your uh, charger in here. You can also just disassemble the blaster. It's really up to you. Okay, so one little mistake that I actually just fixed up myself is that uh, I didn't leave enough slack on this XT60 connector. So where I want this battery to end up is right here because this is going to pop out of a hole for charging and you need to make sure you need to leave enough slack on this to get in there. Now this will all fit, it's just going to be a little tight, but um, something like that. I think ideally you'd make it a little bit longer and have that connector sitting back here just for convenience sake more than anything. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to solder these onto here. Uh, we're going to solder the fan leads, test them, and then we're going to cut one last hole for the, um, our hole, hole shaped connector where the XT60 cord will pop out. So what you want to do if you are going to have one of these uh, plates is that you're going to take this plate and you're actually going to drop it in the blaster. And for now, just like that, we're going to connect everything together as if we were actually closing up the blaster, just like so. 
and here you'll see that there's a hole. And now what you can do is take a... All right, so after you've lined this plate up, and obviously you could have done this earlier, but uh, I w wanted to make sure that no one was making cuts they didn't need to. Um, I basically just marked that off so I know where to cut, just enough to get the connector through. That cut does not need to be perfect at all because it is not going to be able to be seen uh, in the blaster. It's totally covered up. It's just a path for that cable to travel through. So now we'll go ahead and solder the fan on just like before. It was, I believe it was uh, red. These connections can be a real pain to get them to stick. So you wanna be careful, test them at the end, and then I'm gonna fill the void with hot glue after I'm done. One additional thing that I do like to do with a solder joint like this is first, uh, we need to test it. And uh, so now I'm gonna flick, this, the, flick the top switch up. Yep, we are good. Our voltage is not high enough yet for sure, but at least we're started. What I do like to do is fill this void with uh, hot glue. And what this will do is just absolutely stop, make sure that those don't move anywhere. Um, now you don't wanna put too much in where you get it uh, touching the fan blades or anything like that, of course, but I essentially want to fill this void both for air leakage and for uh, just making sure that weld doesn't go because that solder joint is um, a pretty easy one to have problems with, I think. And as soon as that cools, we can actually put this all um, back together. In fact, I can... Next thing we need to do here is check the outgoing voltage. So I'm going to set this, uh, my little meter, on just a 50 volt setting, which will show us one to 50 volts. Obviously a newer meter or a digital meter will give you much more accuracy. Uh, what we're looking is getting this up to 22 to 24 volts. Um, so there's a little screw up on top. And so we'll, we'll rev it up and we'll get an idea of what we're at. So you just dial up by uh, di turning this small knob in. Be very gentle with it because it will go, uh, uh, it, it's, reasonably fragile. And again, we're just gonna aim for 22 volts. Okay, so now we've got it running at about 22 volts. And we should be all set. So before I finally put this away, I wanted to run through the wiring one more time, just so we can see what's happening. I'll also put up a, on the on screen here, put a, up a chart. But essentially we have negative coming into the blaster through the rev switch and back out to both the fan and split over to the on off switch which goes to the flywheels positive coming in from the from the battery terminal going straight to the flywheels and then also going back out to the voltage booth circuit which is the fan that way when you you don't want the flywheels going they don't you can just rev or when you flick the switch, you've got everything. All right, now we just reassemble. And I've tucked this little cord through, slotted this little guy in here, slotted this little connector in. I just wanna make sure nothing's pinching, of course. Try to get it all to fit um, as cleanly as possible. May have a little extra slack here for the for the blower, but that should be fine. So now we're ready to assemble, but right before that, I'm gonna give the line leading up here a little hot glue because it tends to, it can tend to uh, fall into the flywheels, which we want it staying far away from. I'll just use this opportunity to uh, hot glue a little bit of this lead here in just so these aren't moving around either. And then we can put our actual trigger back in as well and test that that still works. And you wanna make sure that that spring is definitely there when you go. You should have nice clean trigger pull if you did the full auto because it definitely makes the trigger pull a lot lighter. Uh, from there, we are ready to finally close up the blaster and uh, give it a real test run. You wanna definitely check that all your wires aren't pinching and nothing's getting clamped in between or anything like that while you put it back together. So do take, take a little time and care to look at all the edges and the corners and make sure that there's no, no pinch or, or crimping happening. Um, this little top plate will just uh, 
kind of snap in at the end typically. There we go. And we've got our blower. So now we've got this all cleaned up and put together. Now we're back to that original point where we can put our screws back in. So bring those back out. This is the fully assembled um, tubing piece. There are two small glues, glue joints you'll need to glue right here, and you'll need to glue the base back here. This should be pretty obvious when you put them together. And I even just use hot glue on these, that way if I ever need to take them apart it's a lot easier. You could use any glue you want, epoxy or something like that would be fine. Uh, now we're ready to assemble the parts, and we, the 3D printed parts, so we'll first put this uh, front piece in with the back already attached. This slots into the existing little tabs back here, so it locks into place. Then we'll thread this next long tube through with the small nub up. These pieces here will fit, they vary a little bit depending on the printing, but they um, should fit fairly snug. If they aren't super snug, then you'll want to put a just a little dab of hot, a little uh, tiny bit of hot glue on the outside and, and run them through. Uh, I feel like hot glue, again, is a good option because it's not so permanent. And I've gone too far here, I've got to put, so now next we'll put these two these two in at the same time. <clears throat> oh no, it's perfect. And then finally the uh, last top piece. So the top should fit like this. Fits like this together and we'll slot straight in. And then again, in this, this circumstance, I think I'm just going to put a little bit of hot glue right there to hold this together. Now, the reason I've gone with hot glued parts versus 3D printed um, attached parts, because I could print this back and front as, as one piece, but the reasoning there is that um, I feel like the pieces are a little stronger not being printed as one, less likely to break. It's also less wasted filament to print them as one. And because of that, I think that this is a, is a better better way for me to go about it. Um, they're also a little easier to print with to just having one piece at a time because I don't print these as a set. I print literally one piece here, one piece there. And so it's a little bit of a slow process. So now we can put this back cap in. It really has no purpose other than being the butt of the blaster and uh, just holding, holding things in place. And so there we have it. This is the final Hurricane. It is completely assembled, ready to go. From here, of course, I expect that there will be some people doing some really awesome paint jobs, and uh, there's a lot of other options around there too. Now, this little uh, door for the uh, charge cable, that's just the way I like to do it because I like the balance with the battery being up front, and I think it works really well. You could also modify this whole system and we could push the fan up forward and have room for the battery in the back. But personally, I really like this as my loading right here. Loading the blaster is super simple. You just flip up, make sure this isn't powered, grab a handful of rounds and essentially just drop them in as fast as you can. And every time you jam up too much, you can just run your rev trigger. Helps to cover the door too, of course and then they should fly straight through. And after they're flying through, you can... You can, uh, you can fire them on out. So let's do a quick firing test with uh, full load. From here, you've got it completely assembled. You can continue to paint and do any other mods you like to do. Enjoy your new blaster. I hope you do one yourself. Uh, it's my personal favorite. I have a semi-auto and a full-auto version along with my Electro 3-shot burst version. In the future, I'm definitely going to work on some Arduino-powered ones as well, but my programming uh, skills are pretty much non-existent. So I've got some learning to do, and that's definitely slowing up some of my projects. 
Uh, thanks for watching. I uh, hope that this video was useful to you. It definitely took us a long time to make. This was about a 10 hour day to get this whole thing shot. Um, I have a lot of respect for anybody that does tutorial videos because even shooting them simply, they're just still a ton of work to explain while you're doing something and try to make it make sense. Until next time, I'm out of darts.